All right, today we're going to take a look at some of the cool little tricks that I've come to kind of figure out with uh, the Control 4 programming interface with different drivers and just some, some neat stuff you can do with, um, with even some older equipment. I have Control 4 in my house, put it all together. Um, you know, not a whole hell of a lot of automation involved, but some of the more convenient things are in there. Um, anyone who knows how to program this stuff knows there's certain things that are kind of nuanced and a bit of a pain in the ass. So I'll show you some things you may or may not know as a way to kind of work around some of them in a virtual project here. So if you're new to programming Control 4, um, you know, whether you've gone to get certified or not, there's, you're going to find your own way to kind of make everything flow the way you want to. Um, depending on the layout, I typically like to start with a, um, a head end equipment area, especially if you're going to have a rack or something like that. And that's typically where I'll keep most things that are central to um, the architecture of the project. So you just go to locations on the right side over here and typically what I'll do is just add a room and call it head end. And from there I'll start building out the project with the controller that might be in there. For this one we're just gonna go with a um, you know what, we'll go with an HC800 because that's what I use in my house right now. And one of the things I like about the HC800 is, um, you know, if you're, if you're looking to put something together for your own place, um, you know, it's still got plenty of horsepower, still going to run OS3, and it has all the benefits of the higher end controllers with the um, contacts and relays on the back, the serial ports, all that good stuff. So you got plenty of IO to work with there. Um, so the first thing I'll show you that I did was in the garage uh, of my house, there's a probably a 50 year old um, garage door opener from Genie, one of the, the very first ones that you had to get like a add-on RF module to be able to open it from the the little brick uh, controller from your car and obviously I wasn't going to be able to find that so the only way I had to open it was through a little classic doorbell switch where you're just you know you're essentially just closing a contact so I thought about it and I said well I have contact closures and relays on the back of the HC800 so if I just run a cat cat wire all the way out to the the door motor I can still have that um that little mechanical switch or I can automate it without having to buy you know a, a new door motor or any type of interface it's just a matter of getting a wire there so the way you would do that is you search for Actually, I think in my drivers, they have under motorization, a garage door relay. So, yep. There, where is it? Garage door sensor. Yeah, well, for this, we'll just do a generic relay. Or well, let's try garage door. Garage door sensor, garage door. I think this is what we want. So obviously this is not gonna be in the head end, so I would add a garage and just move this into here. And for mine, what I also did was I picked up a, um, a Honeywell contact sensor and you can get any type of sensor 
um, if you want to be able to monitor the door state. So for this, you can use the supplied relay, which I think is a garage door sensor. Where are we? Electronic gate, yeah, garage door sensor. I don't know. Relay contact. Okay, so that's both in one, I guess. Let's just look at the connection here. Yeah, so this will give you both. You have the, the relay for opening and the contact sensor for the, um, the door state. So we can get rid of the other one. If you weren't going to implement a contact sensor, which kind of you probably should, because otherwise, you know, you're not going to know whether the door is open or closed unless you're in front of it. Um, so for those of you that have foresight and let's say you've got someone coming by and you need to just open the garage door for them, you know, sure, you can say, hey, is my door open or closed? Or with this, the way we're going to set it up, you'd be able to know the door state through the app. So we'll get rid of that and all you're really going to do for connection wise is you're going to connect the relay to relay one on the HC800 and the contact sensor to the contact sensor and with your wire you know you you connect it appropriately at the other end and you'll have in navigators for the garage when you go to the actual room and under navigator when you go to locks and sensors you'd be able to see the garage door and that would be one of the first things that well in this case it'd be the only thing that populated for the garage and you'd be able to open and close the door and know the state of it um, whether it's open or closed based on that contact sensor and for those of you don't, that don't know what you would do is you would mount the little magnet on the door end and the wired um, contact closure on the you know the frame of the door so that way when the magnet comes in or out of range of the uh, the contact sensor it's gonna tell you hey the doors open or no the doors closed so that was um, that was one of the the cooler things I thought I was able to do in this this older place that I lived in um, Mainly because when I when when I came to see the place, the landlord was like, "Hey, uh, you know, a new garage door opener. It's only like two hundred bucks. You know, if you really want to do it, the the door works otherwise." Um, and he's a really cool guy. But basically, I went in there. I found out it had a blown capacitor. It cost me twelve dollars to fix that. And then I kind of fell down the rabbit hole with this. And honestly, it worked out great. You know, with with my Foresight subscription, I'm able to be around the block I can pull up the app open the garage door there's ways you can um, have this you know you can you can tie it to a custom button or some type of sequence um, I'm sure you could even do something with the if this then that driver based on your GPS location so that way when you got within you know 10 feet or 20 feet of the uh, the garage when you were coming home it would open it up for you and you pull right in set a little timer so that way it closes down but you you really want to be careful with something like that because you know I'm sure there's there's loopholes around that some way um, so that's that another really cool driver that I found a lot of people either don't know about or don't really harness the power of is um, is one that I was able to work in and kind of used with some of the shortfalls of Sonos. So the original Sonos driver in Control 4 um, from I think it was Extra Vegetables used to give you all sorts of uh, you know ability to, to basically use the, the Sonos natively and when they changed their API and kind of went to you know their closed architecture where you have to use their their app it almost made more sense to just import your services and use control for music but so many people um, have Sonos and they're used to Sonos and they want to continue to have that so there are a couple of ways that you can you know still 
make things work a little bit better when it comes to Sonos. So where are we here? Why am I not seeing Sonos? Certified only. Sonos. I don't know why I'm not finding that driver. It's very odd. Uh, let's see, manufacturer. Sonos. Here we go. So for Sonos and for this particular example, we're going to go ahead and assume that we have a Sonos amp that has the HDMI out or the HDMI in rather for the arc as well as a, um, a regular line in audio RCA jack. And there used to be, um, you know, a lot of different ways you could group Sonos and stuff like that with the extra vegetables driver. But one of the things I found in uh, an installation I was on earlier was um, the need to be able to have the Sonos pull to its line in, its RCA line in, when a video source was selected on the TV. And in this particular setup, there was a rack in the basement, and this TV was on the other side of the house. The wiring in place was only two Cat6 and a coax cable. And it was a Samsung frame TV, so we were doing IP control. That was one of my Cat6. And then the Balan was my second Cat6. And it was not anything special as far as Balans go. Um, I was doing the programming on this job. The other technician, uh, who was also a... I guess he was the project manager when it came down to it. And he also, you know, he gets his hands dirty, so I'll give him credit there. Um, he he came to me and said, hey, we need TV audio through the ceiling speakers. How can we do that? I said, well, you're going to need to, you know, have some type of line into the Sonos amp. So, you know, with the wiring that you have in place, though, there's only a handful of ways that it can really be done. So he, he pieced together a, um, we came out of the one connect box of the Samsung frame via optical and into a optical to digital coax converter. Use the RG6 that was in place as a digital coax cable down to the rack and then put that into a DAC, a digital digital to analog converter for those of you who don't know and out of the DAC went RCA into the Sonos and the way I was able to make it so that way it was a seamless transition when you turned on the television and the Sonos knew to go to that input was using this cool little driver called the AV path setter oops And where are we? So this guy, the best way I can describe it is it's essentially like um, you could you could almost call it like a software DAC. So it's going to give you the ability to have inputs connect to or outputs connect to inputs that normally your regular drivers won't let you do so for we'll replicate the entire example here so that way you can see everything the way it kind of came together and you know unfortunately I can't show you the end result but I can tell you that um, when you selected a watch source the Sonos was automatically going to its its line audio input rather than you having to then go into the Sonos app and select line in so that way it, it knew it was going for a TV input and um, under normal circumstances if 
you know, if the Sonos was right there and you were using an HDMI um, on an arc output, this really wouldn't be a problem. So it is a little more specialized, but there are going to be instances where these weird things, you know, come up and, you know, a lot of people, they get, they get stuck on how to actually make that work. So let's add, I think it's uh, QN75. I'm not even sure of the model number anymore. We'll go with this though. Yeah, this is close enough. So for our control bindings, we're going to say that add in a cable box. Here we go. Scientific Atlanta. Let's get rid of this. The reason why I wasn't finding it was because I had the certified only checkbox there. But let's go back to our bindings here. So from the Samsung TV, we're going to be going to the cable. And also from the Samsung TV, we're going to be connecting the optical audio output to the AV path setter. And then under the AV path setter, which we should see, where is it? There we go. That's the Samsung TV. From the output of the stereo audio, we're going to bring that to the Sonos connection analog input line in. So even though you may have like a whole back end of converters and whacked out crap behind there in order to make this happen, the this piece of software is enabling you to do what you otherwise couldn't do. So if we went back to the Samsung TV, there's no way you can connect this to anything other than something that shows it has the proper input. Um, so th that AV path setter is, is opening up different areas where, you know, you wouldn't have the, the necessary opportunity to be able to, to connect some of this stuff. So when we go into the living room, we then have to set our endpoints, which this is another thing that can kind of trip people up. It did me in the beginning, but the more and more I did it, the more you, you know, sometimes you might forget, but you, uh, you end up remembering after a while when, when you're not hearing or getting the volume control result you're looking for. So we need to disconnect the audio endpoint here. We need to disconnect the video audio endpoint, the video volume, and the audio volume. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring the audio endpoint. So that's going to be just your music. That's going to go to the Sonos. Your video audio endpoint is also going to go to the Sonos. Your video volume will be to the Sonos. And your audio volume will be to the Sonos because that amp is going to be controlling volume as well as your output. So looking at the screen we know that the video endpoint where the picture is stopping from the cable box or whatever source it might be to this samsung tv is at the samsung tv and all the audio and video audio is going to be going through the sonos um, various inputs and you know whether it be the the digital stream for pandora or the analog audio input from the cable box or whatever it might be it could be a converted output you know let's say you had a an apple tv or even just some of the the streaming apps coming from the television they're going to be kicked back out through the optical audio um, input or output rather and once it's converted through all of that crap it's going to shoot back out due to that AV path setter right here because anything that comes in from the Samsung TV's optical output is going to come out.
to the Sonos analog input. So that one I thought was pretty cool and you know the 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 other guys in in the company I'm with granted they don't do a lot of control for when they do do it they seem to get themselves into some pickles and I came from another company that did pretty much only control for so a lot of these field applications I found that when they stick me on one of these jobs to help out they they typically do come in handy so this one I remember reading about it I think on C4 forums and I actually utilized it in my own setup um, in a different apartment where I had a I want to say I was using a zone 2 audio input on a receiver in a satellite room um, the same way with uh, you know the the TV's video input was coming in off of a, a, a matrix so you know of the four screens in the house they all shared one cable box one Apple TV um, I think a PlayStation and like a home theater PC so that matrix would send audio and video via HDMI and I would kick it back out to the receiver from the TV's optical output, go through a DAC into the zone two of the receiver. And this enabled me to do that without trying to figure out or make a driver for some type of DAC, you know, a virtual version of that software. So AV Path Setter, remember that one because it can definitely help you out in a pinch. Um, I think that's about it for this video. Uh, if you want to see more Control 4 videos or if you have any other type of uh, questions when it comes to this stuff, uh, I've been doing Control 4 for quite a few years. I was certified out in Utah at their um, headquarters, which was uh, a really a very cool experience. I had never been to Utah before and getting off that plane and seeing the mountains for the first time was really, really unreal. Driving up one, getting altitude sickness, um, a lot of that was, was very interesting stuff. I think I was out there in May, and the day I got there it was 80 degrees, and then the next morning it was snowing. So it was it was kind of kind of a, a a climate shock when you were there, but really cool state, really cool company. Um, they they were top notch to to all of us. And the the one thing I'll say about when you go to get certified, whether it's there or I heard things were a little bit different in their North Carolina area, um, and I'm sure it goes the same thing for their Chicago office. Then again, I can't imagine many people are going to be there very soon or for the immediate future with all this virus crap going on. Um, the real world application versus what you learn in a, in a classroom is gonna vary so much. And a lot of that's gonna be based on um, how well everything is planned on, you know, by your company for the installation, how they manage customer expectations and really get to you know, realizing the, the end goal of the system. Some people, you know, they just want a small one room control setup for a TV with maybe a pair of bookshelf speakers for music and audio. Other people, you know, they want to do a whole house with just beyond crazy stuff where you're getting into all sorts of relays and stuff like that. And as a matter of fact, I'll show you one other cool thing that I found works on just about any amp with 12 volt triggers and this was something that um, goes a long way so let's say you have a multi-room amp or even just a single room amp that has 12 volt trigger in 12 volt trigger out um, the way I always do it so that way I can ensure that this amp turns on and is turned off properly every time with the room settings is I use a either four or eight zone 
what's typically referred to as a dumb amp um, in Control Force driver. So four zone, and for this one we'll, we'll go with a four zone power amp. Now it could be for a two channel amp, doesn't matter. I'll use the four zone um, power amplifier. So we'll stick that in the head end and we'll call it just amp. So with the connections on the amp for power, there's a specific way and it doesn't matter what, you're, what amp you're using. Like I said, as long as it has 12 volt in, 12 volt out, um, you wire it up to the relay and the contact sensor. And the way you do it is if let's say it was a uh, a mini adapter on both ends of the um of the amplifier you'd cut the wire and you'd be left with um a positive and a negative wire and what you, what I do is when you're let me see if I can pull up a picture of the back of one of these controllers HC800 See how well we can see this. What I want to do is get to a picture of the terminal blocks on the end, which I'm sure I'm not going to be able to do now. This keeps bringing me back to the same thing. Let's see if I can find one. Or right, here we go. So not a great picture, but so what you have is you're gonna have a set of contacts and relays. And I believe it goes uh, common signal um, ground and common NC and NO, something like that. But the way, or t no, 12 volt positive um, signal and ground or something like that, and then common NC and NO. The way I would do this is you wire a jumper from the common to the 12 volt positive within this terminal block. And then you wire both your grounds from the 12 volt in and 12 volt out together into the ground. You'll see one, one of the terminals says GND. So you twist those together, wire that in there. Your positive from the 12 volt out goes into signal. And your positive from the 12 volt in goes into the um, normally opened relay. Now, when you send a power command for that amp, what's going to happen is it's going to close the contact on that controller. And because you have the common and the 12 volt jumped, it's going to send that 12 volt signal, click the amp on. You then choose your music source, do whatever it is you're going to do, proceed like normal. When you go to turn it off, it's going to look for a signal and then cut it. And that's how you'll know, the, or that's how the controller knows to turn off the amplifier. And you'll actually be able to monitor the amp's power state right over here. Even though it's not a control four, four zone amp, it doesn't matter because all it's looking for is power signal in and out. So over here right now it says um, power status unknown if it was on if it was obviously connected to an amplifier through composer you'd be able to see that the power is on or the power is off and you can adjust some of those time delays and everything else um, so that's another pretty cool thing I've done this with $90,000 Burmeister amps and $12 you know crown amps um, works every time and it really ensures that you know, the amp is going to go on when it's supposed to and go off when it's supposed to. And, you know, if nothing else, prolong the life of the amp a little bit more because it's not just staying on in a rack for the whole time. So 
that'll be about it for this one. Thanks for watching. And again, if you have any other questions or anything on Control 4 videos or the Control 4 system, if you like to see something else, um, let me know. Thanks.